Great. Thanks. Great. So at a high level, the, the goal of this work is to make it easier to do machine learning by applying programming language technology. And this broadly falls under the field of prob probabilistic programming. And so let me just start off with a little bit of background to, to orient ourselves. Um, the goal is to make inferences from data. And so in this case, the data you might get is a collection of points in the Euclidean plane. And you want to say something interesting about this data. For example, in this case, you might want to figure out if the points are in clusters. And so in this toy example, um, you might say that each of these points belongs to one of three clusters. And you might be interested in where the cluster locations are. And paralysis modeling is this machine learning technique that gives you a uniform way to do this. And the way you do this is by constructing this model query inference tuple that I'm going to go over uh, in the next few slides. So by model, and in this case, I'm restricting myself to generative models, the idea is to kind of write down a stochastic process that you believe generates the data. And into this process, you're going to encode how you believe the data was actually generated by actually encoding in what underlying structure in the data you think there is. So in the case of clustering, you might want to build in the fact that these data points actually come from clusters. And so you can actually write a program to, to encode these beliefs. So in, in the first for loop, what, what we're saying is that we have k equals three randomly chosen clusters that we're going to sample from a multivariate normal distribution, which is just a distribution on the Euclidean plane, this example. In the next two loops, we're going to say that each data point comes from a discrete random variable, which is, a ca which is categorically distributed, so that's the z. And then finally, for each y, which is the data point that we actually observe, we're going to choose, uh, choose it randomly from a multivariate normal distribution sampled at the appropriate cluster location. So, so for each data point, we're going to figure out which cluster it belongs to and then sample it. And we can actually run this program, and it looks something like this. Right, so, so if we just took that Python program, ran it, and plotted it, we would get something that looks like this. So of course, this by itself isn't that interesting. What you want to do is actually be able to learn something. And so now, now the question is, given, given this sort of synthetic way of imagining how data is generated, and given actual observed data, how do we figure out the distribution on the cluster locations that actually produces something that looks more like the observed data instead of a synthetically imagined data set? So you can formalize this as a paralysis query. And so now the algorithm, the inference algorithm, is actually the thing that takes you from your data, your model, and your query, and gets you sort of wh where the clusters are actually located. So this is just an example of an inference algorithm. In this case, it's a Gibbs sampler. And kind of the way it works is it, you basically initialize the algorithm at a random starting point, And it, it does some tricks to eventually uh, randomly walk its way to to where the clusters are located. And so just to summarize, um, you sort of make inferences from data in this framework by making these model query inference tuples. And now there's actually one major challenge with this approach, and it's that the process of doing inference is analytically intractable in general. And for our purposes, this just means that um, you have to solve this integral, and so sometimes we don't know the analytic solution to the integral. And also, th these integrals tend to be uh, high dimensional. Um, so in this case, actually, you need to integrate out over the size of the data set. So each z was sort of which cluster each point belonged to. So if I gave you 10 million data points, then this integral has at least 10 million things that you need to integrate out. And so, so that's really challenging. Um, the solution in practice is to sort of apply black box <laughs> techniques that sort of leverage model specific properties. So if, if you know that a portion of your model has gradients, and you might want to use that to sort of uh, optimize your algorithm. And another thing is to sort of apply compositions of different black box algorithms. So there are a lot of no free lunch theorems that said there's no one uniform black box algorithm that will work well in all cases. And so by sort of composing different methods together, you may be able to get an algorithm that is much more efficient. And actually, in, in this Gaussian mixture model, some of the variables were continuous and some were discrete. So if you actually wanted to apply a gradient method, you, you couldn't apply it directly out of the box because uh, some of the discrete variables you can't take the gradient of. Right. So as I said in the beginning, this is sort of what probabilistic programming as the machine learning community understands it to be. And there, there are a lot of systems already developed that sort of try to make it easier to do inference by sort of building a system by designing a programming language for expressing models, and then sort of giving you a few knobs to turn and 
automatically translate that into an inference algorithm. So I've kind of broken down sort of the current landscape along two axes. The horizontal axis is basically how expressive your, your modeling language is. So by DSL, I mean uh, it's, a, it's a domain specific language for handling a, a, a subset of models. And by general purpose, I mean sort of it's embedded in, in a general purpose programming language. And on the y-axis, uh, I've sort of tried to separate out along how expressive your black box versus uh, completely programmable. So by black box, I really mean you just have an API where you, you can only apply algorithm A, B, or C. And by programmable, I mean I give you a method, a means to compose it. And so from a practical standpoint, um, the, the green box is, is pretty useful because if, if your model fits into that DSL, then you can just run it, hit a, hit a button, and, and get some useful results out. And it's kind of an open question whether sort of the, the more expressive general purpose modeling languages are useful or not. And, and that's an active area of research. And again, the, the issue with building these systems is that we, we can write down the model, but at the end of the day, we want to be able to perform inferences on them. And inference is intractable. And so each of, each of these systems, or each of these systems have uh, applied many different methods to try to uh, overcome the challenge of inference. Um, one of them is to leverage model-specific properties, so some use really uh, clever black box inference techniques and implement them. Some give you composable inference, so that so some languages even go as far to design entire programming languages for writing inference algorithms. And another approach is to leverage parallelism. And so now the challenge is that there are a lot of good solutions, and now we need sort of a way to sort of combine them without sort of exploding the complexity of such a system. And really, the, the, key, the key idea in our work is really just to apply traditional compiler design to this problem and try to factor out all, all the challenges according to intermediate languages. So for, for each problem, we're going to try to build an intermediate language that kind of handles that problem and try to figure out um, sort of what are the transformations that we need to do to get it from a a model and query which is very declarative to something that actually runs and, and can give us an answer. Right, and of course we don't, we're not tackling this in the general case, so we're in the, the DSL case and we're trying to sort of improve sort of the flexibility of the inference you can generate. Right, so just to show you kind of what the DSL looks like, I've written that Gaussian mixture model. So this was the Python program written as an Augur v2 program. And as you can see, it, it basically mirrors random variable notation. So you basically have a sequence of random variable declarations, what their distributions are, and how, how many times to repeat them. And the, the, the repetition structure is a, a parallel comprehension, meaning that it's independent of the order of evaluation. So typically in, in parallelistic modeling, you say you want k random variables with some distribution. And in that case, you don't mean that you want k sequentially in that order, but you just want k of them. And so that's what the parallel comprehension uh, means. And there's another restriction on the comprehensions, and it's that the uh, comprehension bounds must be known at compile time. And we're going to take advantage of this later on when we compile some of these algorithms to the GPU. And just to give you an example of how to use the system, um, this is some Python code. So there's a Python interface to the system. Um, there are several things you can do. The first is you can sort of set the compile, the compilation options. So in this case, we're compiling to the CPU. And you can also compile the algorithm to the GPU. Um, the second thing is this thing called a user schedule. And this is basically a small combinator language that we're going to give you to sort of uh, help you configure the MCMC algorithm you generate. And if you don't write this, the compiler will use a very simple heuristic to come up with a, with a schedule. And the last thing is we compile at runtime when we know the values of the data and the hyperparameters. And so this query samples from that posterior, from, from that distribution. Right. So in a traditional compiler, uh, we understand sort of the phases of compilation pretty well. And in, in, the case, in this case, um, I guess I'm defining the front end to be, to be the same thing. So we want to take sort of that modeling language that I just showed you and convert it into some intermediate language. Just that in this case, uh, what is that intermediate language? Because we wouldn't want to use LLVM IR in this case. 
And so to do that, I'm going to need to tell you a little bit about probability densities. And for our purposes, you should think of a density as basically a, a function which lets you evaluate the likelihood of two configurations. So if I gave you the configuration on the left where the cluster centers are basically located where all the points are, I would say that that has higher density or higher likelihood than the configuration on the right where things are a little bit off-center. And these densities are also amenable to sort of symbolic manipulation and, and similar to what you would do in a basic calculus class. And so you, we can basically define an intermediate language that captures um, what densities look like. And, and this is fairly standard and uh, this is the statistics community to, to use densities. And so this is basically just trying to replicate that. And we're going to add some types uh, just to make it easier to compile. And just as an example, that's the, the same GMM in, in the intermediate language. And so it, it, these end up being very uh, simple one-line formulas. But nevertheless, the inference algorithm for this is quite complicated. Right, so now once we got the sort of model into the intermediate language, now we need to do something about it. So in a traditional compiler, um, the middle end you know, usually is just about optim optimizing the IL. In this case, we're actually going to try to reify the model and the query as a high-level executable MCMC algorithm. So that's the job of what the middle end is trying to do. And now to do this part, I need to tell you a little bit about how Markov Chain Monte Carlo works. So for our purposes, we should think of a black box Markov Chain Monte Carlo algorithm or MCMC algorithm as something that takes a density and two things about that density. One is a predicate about whether something holds on that density or not. So for example, is this density uh, differentiable? And the second is we want to write a functional or a higher order function that sort of operates on that density. So basically the predicate says, can I apply the functional to the data? And so there, there are several different ones. Um, some require you to imp implement integrals, some require derivatives. Um, some re don't require you to implement anything at all, so identity. And once we have these base MCMC kernels, then we can actually sort of, uh, sort of com compose them. So if I have a way of sampling a distribution in two dimensions, and I have another way of sampling it in, in one dimension, I can glue them together and have a 3D sampler. And that's kind of what I mean by composition. And, and there are other ways to compose them as well. And so given this structure, we can again uh, define a kernel IL or an intermediate language that basically captures all that structure. And so this is sort of another intermediate language that we're going to need to use. And the interesting thing about this language is that it's uh, parametric in the type of code it carries. So the K code um, is kernel implemented with code of, or implemented with code of type code. And for that code, we're going to use different kinds of intermediate languages. Um, to, to implement that code. And so again, this code is for implementing the functionals that each base MCMC kernel requires. So we're going to implement integrals, derivatives in each of these different languages. Right, so now, now let me kind of show you how this works at a high level. Um, so we're going to compile this schedule, which does HMC or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo on mu, which is the cluster locations, and does discrete GIB sampling on Z, or the, the cluster assignments. And as a reminder, the, the GIBs requires us to implement integrals, and the HMC algorithm requires us to implement gradients. Right. So in this case, the, the, cluster or the cluster assignments are discrete random variables. And that corresponds to, to implementing that integral, which we can convert to summation. And so here I just dumped out sort of the compiler, uh, what the compiler produced. And so you can just see that it's basically just I implementing the, the summation. For continuous variables, uh, we're going to have to do something a little bit smarter, and we, we can't handle it in all cases. So uh, there's something called a conjugate prior or conjugacy relation. And, and basically what that means is that if you have an equation with densities of a certain form that come from two distributions that, that you know, then or two specific distributions, then we know the closed form solution already, and we can implement this via table lookup. Now, underneath the hood, we're going to need to do some re uh, normalization or canonicalization, and this is handled with a simple rewrite system. Right now, we, we don't 
uh, use a computer algebra system to do this. And it'd be an interesting direction of future work. And actually some paralysis program systems actually do this. With respect to gradients, um, there's this method called uh, reverse mode automatic differentiation. And this is a standard technique that you can look up in the literature. And so I'm not gonna go into too much detail about it. Um, but the interesting thing about the, the Augur V2 implementation is that first we implement it as a source-to-source -source transformation, whereas most implementations sort of instrument the code. And as you can see, so up here I put a selected translation. It's a pretty simple translation. And so the, the reverse mode comes from the fact that, um, so if you look at the translation of the let expression, you kind of translate the body of the function and then translate uh, the, the derivative of x equals e. And so in general, you're going to need a stack if you have complex control flow to kind of reverse the flow of computation. And if you remember, we had parallel comprehensions which had order independent evaluation. So in this case, we can actually optimize the stack away. So th this is just an example of sort of language, like nifty little language design techniques that you can use to optimize your uh, implementation of automatic differentiation. Um, a tricky thing here is that these translations will, in general, introduce um, addition, a lot of atomic increment additions that we'll need to handle very carefully when we try to parallelize this code. Great. So now I'm up to the back end. Um, so now we've gone from model to model intermediate language, and now we have executable MCMC code. And now we actually want to take this code to, to CUDA C code. And this part is very uh, similar to a standard compiler. And th the job of the backend is, is really just to, hand, to, to manage resources and to allocate resources. And so this has three phases. The first is you want to, or in our case, we want to statically bound all the memory usage. And, and this fo follows from the fact that our comprehension bounds, we had, uh, they were known at compile time, and we also want to compile to the GPU. And so we restrict it there. Second step is to reify parallelism if you're compiling to the GPU, and I encourage you to take a look at the paper to see how we handle the, the atomic parallels. And I think in, in this area, there's, there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, and lastly, the, the cogen step is, is pretty straightforward. Right, so I'm gonna show you two evaluations. Um, so this graph right here is known as a log predictive probability graph. And you think of log predictive probability as sort of a proxy for how well your algorithm is learning. So on the x-axis, I have time. And on the y-axis, I have log, predict log predictive probability. And the intuition is that sort of the more time I give you to train, the better you should be able to make predictions. And so on this graph, you basically want them to converge to the, to the same point. Um, but the difference is that each algorithm takes a different amount of time to converge to that same point. And so here I'm comparing against sort of two other widely used systems, JAGS and STAN. So JAGS focuses specifically on one kind of MCMC algorithm and STAN on another kind. And here I've uh, sort of configured Augur to run multiple, to generate multiple different kinds of in inference algorithms. And you can see that some of the algorithms are better. So for example, the, the Gibbs sampling seems to be the fastest, whereas sort of the, the gradient-based sampler takes much longer. And sort of another experiment we ran is to try to figure out sort of the effect of parallelism. So in, in the previous example, I, I did it on a toy, toy model. So in this case, we're going to use real data. And uh, the model we use is latent Dirichlet allocation, or LDA. And you can think of it as sort of a clustering model, but for topics. So, so which cluster you belong to is which topic that, that document is about. And so these are real world data sets on the order of a million data points, I think, and with about 10,000 dimensions. And you can see that sort of on, when we apply parallelization, sort of the larger the data set and, and the more topics we use. So the dash 50 is, is 50 topics or um, 50 clusters, 100 clusters, 150. So, so the larger the data set and the more clusters you have, the, the GPU gives you better performance. Um, we've also found cases where the parallelization is not the right thing to do. So uh, in particular for, for uh, gradient-based MCMC methods, we, we haven't been able to get the parallelization to work quite well. And in some cases, it's, it's an order of magnitude lower. So just to summarize, we kind of presented a compiler design for how to 
transform a model and query, which is declarative, into an executable in CMC algorithm. And I, I think it's a really rich space where um, a lot of these systems so far have been built by members in the machine learning community, and, and trying to bring compiler technology to this is, is a very rich and interesting field. And it'd be interesting to figure out you know, what other compiler designs are there. And if I can uh, leave you with one last point, um, is just to emphasize that sort of when you design a system like this, the, the problem really is with, with the inference and if you can get it to scale and if you can get it to scale and, and be fast and efficient. And so it's online at uh, that GitHub and I'd, uh, thanks to uh, a bunch of people and, yep, questions. A couple of questions. Hi, uh, great talk, thanks. I uh, just have a quick question. Um, so another approach to um, building composable transformations is to have the input and output language be the same. Um, in your approach, you follow something different where you, know, you go from your language to kernel IL and density IL. Are there any advantages you saw about taking that approach as opposed to the first one? Yeah, so I mean, each of the languages tries to take care of a different aspect. So some languages are just designed to expose the parallelism in the algorithm. Then after that, we want some algorithms that expose how, exactly how much memory to use. And so I guess if you wanted to reason about that and reason about mathematics, like mathematical properties of the model, um, for me, it was just easier to try to separate all of that out and try to handle different things at different layers of abstraction. So I guess you could do it, but I, I, it would be really hard, in my opinion, or yeah. I, I wouldn't see how to, do, to write a static analysis that handled all of those things uniformly in the same language without it being an extremely complicated st static analysis. Any other questions? Hi, um, yeah, good talk. So I'm wondering, for for some of the frameworks you showed at the beginning, they use other inference techniques such as variational inference. Can you handle those in your? So framework? right now I'm restricted to Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling techniques. Um, we are thinking about extending it to variational techniques, but in in general, I think the verdict, at least from the machine learning community, is that if you want to get your algorithm to scale, you should do uh, variational techniques. Um, but I guess the interesting thing about designing systems like this from my perspective is if you sort of factor out all your steps from by using intermediate languages, you can actually reuse the compiler or most of the compiler. And so, yeah. Thanks for a great talk. I, I uh, really like this project. I'm trying to figure out how expressive the modeling language is. Uh, so does it have uh, recursion, for example? Could you do PCFGs? How does it compare to uh, the general purpose languages like Church? Right. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I would say that it is a dirt simple language. Um, it expresses fixed it, it expresses a subset of fixed structure uh, Bayesian networks. That, that's exactly my question. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, um, so I was curious about um, whether you could potentially extend the approach to handle um, models that are typically trained by stochastic gradient descent. So for example, um, you know, if you look at uh, deep neural network based models that are increasingly prevalent in the past several years, um, it strikes me that a lot of the solutions that people use to implement such models right now are sort of hand tuned and very specific to the domain. And I was wondering if you see any uh, potential for sort of integrating in that sort of domain with with an approach like yours, where you could imagine, you know, automatically extracting um, some some perhaps using reverse mode automatic differentiation, but some some uh, stochastic optimization procedure that sort of generalizes the deterministic procedures that you've outlined. Uh, right. So I mean, I guess MCMC is a stochastic procedure. Um, Basically, what, what the compiler does right now is it implements a gradient, and that could be implemented as a stochastic gradient. So you could subs, subsample the data, and we could have a library function 
that does that. But it, it wouldn't work with Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or at least preserve properties of MCMC that you actually want. But where, whereas in a variational inference case, it, it would. And, and that, that's part of the reason why those methods scale a lot better. The expressivity is there. You just need to write a, a, like a library function. Okay, let's thank Daniel.